I was born in Hammersmith Hospital in October 1938. Um, my mo mother was up from Wales. She used to work for my father in my father's shop, which was in Shepherd's Bush um, on the Goldhawk Road near the market. It was called the British Walk Round Stores, and at one time my father had five of them um, around that area of West London. But when the war came, he had to surrender four of the leases because he couldn't get staff um, and you couldn't get insurance. He didn't go to war because he'd had TB as a boy and was unfit. Um, but he was a fire warden. Um, and um, a lot of my early memories are to do with the war uh, because we were bombed and my father moved us out to the suburbs and um, we were then, I was one of those evacuee children who went down to Devon and I remember Devon when I was, I must have been about five then and um, walking home from school in the snow and finding it unbearable and uh, sitting down in the road crying. <laughs> um, uh, but I had a kind of I had two brothers and I was brought up in the suburbs and had a very nice, ordinary childhood. So after the war, came back from Devon and settled back into suburban life. My father used to go up and down on the train to the shop. Uh, my brothers and I went to local schools, except for one period when I bullied or begged my parents to send me to boarding school. I mean, there was no experience of boarding school in the family. My parents didn't want me to go, uh, but I nagged them. Uh, and the reason was I'd sort of got caught up in reading books um, about boarding school life. You know, all the comics of the time, Rover, Champion and Hotspur. I read all those every week and I read Tom Brown's School Days, Fifth Form at St. Benedict's, uh, all the Billy Bunter saga. And I just got it into my head that I wanted to try boarding school. And I just went on to my parents and eventually they gave in. I remember my father went to the library and looked at a book called the Preparatory Schools of Great Britain or something and picked a school. And so off I went. Um, it was a great disappointment. Um, and it was a very bad school as it turned out. And after a year I was, I suppose it must have been about, uh, I think I must have gone, you know, I was nine and a bit and, uh, um, and I stayed there for about a year. But I eventually came to my senses and told my parents they were wasting, I was wasting my time and wasting their money. So I came back and went to local schools and eventually ended up doing my A-levels at uh, a grammar school. And I did pretty well. and. Um, I won a scholarship to Oxford. Um, and there's a break between taking your exams in January and going up in October. And during that time, when I was really just waiting, I found out, we found out that my father had got terminal cancer. My mother and the doctor, for some reason, decided that they were not going to let my father know that it was terminal. They thought that psychologically he wouldn't be able to cope with it. And so there was a conspiracy that life had to go on as normal. Uh, my father's business, the shop, was um, running out of steam and he hadn't been there because he'd been ill for some time and it was running down and it was obvious that it wasn't going to survive. And it was obvious to me uh, that I was unlikely to spend three or four years at Oxford. Um, so I went up to Oxford for one term, um, just a wreck really, I couldn't study, I knew what was the point I thought, and I was very upset about my father being ill and dying. <coughs> so he died the following June, and my mother wanted me to go back, so I went back, um, I hadn't studied, and I failed an exam, and I left, um, and had to get a job. I'd always been quite keen on reading 
and I used to write, try and write short stories. So I thought I'd quite like to do something that involved writing, but I didn't know what. And one day working at the shop, which I'd taken over and was running after my father died, uh, guiding it towards liquidation, just sort of being there to, uh, to handle the death, as it were. Um, one lunch hour I was moseying around in Shepherd's Bush Market and on a bookstall I picked up a book called Madison Avenue by a man called Martin Mayer and I discovered there was a job called copywriting, completely out of I never thought about who wrote the words for ads before and um, I tried to become a copywriter and eventually I got a job uh, in the Kodak advertising department as a copywriter. So it was just a piece of luck. I mean, bad luck followed by uh, good luck. It's a, it's a thing in life, isn't it? Quite often, the, the things that, I mean, I mean, I'm not, my death of my father at the time could never have been good, but it shaped, it, it shaped my life uh, in a way that you couldn't have anticipated. The reason I uh, went to the Kodak advertising department because it was near where I was living because uh, I was still at home with my mother after my father's death. And um, I'd met uh, Eve, who was to become my wife, uh, in a coffee bar, which is, was the kind of meeting place of the times. And she was working in the statistical department of Kodak. And I was talking about, you know, I discovered this job copywriting. And she said, well, I think Kodak's got an advertising department. Why don't you try there? So I did. And um, this, I got the job. And I worked for a man called Gordon Coombs, who was my first copy chief. And I've always been very, very lucky with the people I work for. They've always been inspirational. And Gordon was even though, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't a particularly exalted place to start your career. Um, but there were about eight or nine of us uh, working in the department. We did all the trade and professional ads. The consumer ads were done by Benson's up in proper London in a proper agency. Um, and the people there were either copywriters and art directors on their way down you know, who'd been in advertising agencies and had been fired or got too old and would still wanted to work, and they went down to that. And people like me, who were desperately trying to get into an agency, we were on the way up. Um, and it was great fun. I met for, for friends there I've had uh, kept for ages. Every week we used to, the youngest, young, young Turks, I suppose, at Kodak, um, used to try and get out of Kodak. We read the classifieds and sent off letters trying to get into an agency. And um, I'd got a little portfolio together, which I used to go and show them. My first um, trip was to Irwin Wasey. And I learned a very good lesson at this interview. The graduate director was a man called Paul Usher. And I was shown into his office and he was at the desk writing head down. He just waved me towards the minute stool in front of his office. So I sat down below looking up at him and he went on writing. I thought, am I meant to be saying something? And he looked up and he said, is there anything you desperately want to show me? And I thought, you bastard. And I vowed that I would never, ever do that to anyone who ever came in to see me. Now my second uh, agency trip was more fruitful. I went to Mather and Crowther and took the copy test, which I failed, um, which was um, good for my soul, probably. But they let me take it again because they said I was the Mathers type and they were keen to find a reason to hire me. 
So I redid one question, which was writing about the place where you live. I lived in a very dull little suburb, and I probably gave a very dull little answer. Uh, so I pretended that I lived in Ireland and wrote a kind of lyrical um, passage about Ireland, and uh, that seemed to do the trick. Well, Mather and Crowther, like most agents at the time, separated writers and art directors. So I went into a copy group. And again, it was my second stroke of fortune. I worked for a truly inspirational man called Paul Hoppy. And we worked in a long office, rectangle. The copy chief sat by the window and the junior, uh, the secretary sat by the door, junior writer, and then four writers up to the window. And you worked your way up and you hoped to get to the window and to be a copy chief. Paul Hoppy, the copy chief, worked with another head of art and that was a man called Arthur Wilson and um, Paul and Arthur were just they were both enthusiastic about what they did and they were great to work for and um, I started working on the Triumph Herald account um, I pitched for the Observer account while I was there and I later worked on the Observer again at AMV and I started learning my craft and um, I showed my copy to Paul. He used to look at it and he used to say, um, well, it doesn't make me come on the spot, which I thought was um, do it, meant do it again. Um, I used to get my copy approved eventually and it used to leave the room and end up in another room where the art director sat. And eventually you saw an ad. Uh, sometimes you didn't see the ad till it actually appeared somewhere. Uh, there was no getting together at all of writer and art director. And it was the same with television. You handed a script, left the office, went to a producer, and later you might see it on the television. Um, but even so, I stayed there for about three years, I think. And I did actually get to sit by the window. I became a copy group head and... Uh, the, and I learned a lot there. Uh, I did uh, a TV commercial there um, for the Triumph Herald. Um, the basic uh, message we wanted to get across was independent suspension. So I showed a man in the car following a girl along the road initially, but Eventually she walks off the road and the car follows her and goes down the steps uh, of, uh, of, at the Albert Hall, uh, which was a good demonstration, I thought. And I was quite pleased with the script, handed it over um, to a producer called Roger Adams, and that was it. I mean, I had nothing to do with the production, and I did see it, and I, it was uh, entered for d and and actually got in the book. But... Um, Mesa Crowther had the policy that only the producer got a credit. Uh, everything else was on group basis. And I think that was because they didn't want you to become well known and be poached by other agencies. Because <laughs> nobody ever rings up and says, can I speak to group basis? One of the uh, great attractions at Mesa and Crowther was the creative director, a man called... Um, Shelton, called Shelley by uh, everybody. Um, I realise now, looking back, that he was a wonderful creative director. Um, though he had a light touch on the rudder, um, uh, and it was nearly always a morning touch, uh, rather than afternoon <laughs> touch, because you know, didn't see much of him in the afternoon. But I... Uh, a very early memory there is getting a memo saying like on Tuesday afternoon um, the creative department is going to see Fellini's Eight and a Half which had just come out and in fact we went in two batches so some work was done and Shelley was like that he had an eclectic mind and he believed that creativity needed input and he exposed us and encouraged us to go to exhibitions, listen to music, uh, you know, to actually keep the pot full. And I, I, it, it, I tried to do that myself when I became a creative director. Um, 
didn't have a desk in his office, I remember. And he used to send out well done notes on, he had sort of smoked salmon colored notepaper. So if you ever saw a little folded up note in the in tray, that color, your heart gave a leap. And if you opened it and said, and it said, you know, well done on the Spitfire ad or whatever it was, you know, you beamed and you took it home. And um, again, it's another lesson. It's always a good idea to say thank you and well done. It was while I was uh, at Mather and Crowther and I was doing well there. I'd become a copy chief, a copy group head. I knew about Dordane Burnback because I was buying the New Yorker every week and I was incredibly interested in, you know, American literature. Uh, I knew all about the old Gonquin Hotel and uh, Dorothy Parker and Robert Benchley and all those people. So I was aware that there was this agency in New York producing wonderful work, which I saw in the pages of the New Yorker. But somehow I missed the fact that they were opening in London until one day I was looking through one of the newspapers and I saw this ad for Remington Razors. Whole page ad of the guts, the innards of a Remington electric razor. And the headline said, it takes guts to charge this much for a razor. And down the bottom, there was a picture of a man, you know, not a glamorous model, but a guy with a beard and a razor. And the copy was just wonderful. I, later I found out it was written by John Withers. And I, it was like a moment of revelation to me. And I thought, that's where I uh, would like to be writing ads like that. And so I started writing DDB ads at Mather and Crowther. I'm not sure they noticed or anybody else did, but my Triumph hat ads sort of began to get the flavor of VW ads. And I also obviously then realized that they were operating in London. And I thought, well, much as I love Mother and Crowther, I'm going to try and get a job at DDB. And I went, I did get an interview and John Withers in 1964 said to me, yeah, I like your work. We don't have a spot, but I'll get back to you. And he did. And I joined in 1965. Uh, Mather and Crowther were very nice, threw me a big party at the Savoy, um, told me to come back if it didn't work out. And I said, oh yes, I'm sure I'll be back. Um, uh, uh, but I, I love DDB. Uh, uh, so much, and I was I found it incredibly rewarding, and um, it was from the nerve center, I think, along with CDP, of all, all the changes that were happening in society and in advertising. You know, it's strange to think back that only five or six years before then they were calling the creative department at JWT the editorial department. Most of the people who I, on the copy floor where I sat at Mather's were um, public schoolboys. Um, many of them were really poets who were paying the rent by being in advertising or novelists. You know, Faye Weldon was there, um, Edwin Brock, a lot of very literary. Uh, there were not many working class boys there. Um, and that changed. It changed in New York and it changed in London. And it was a new influx of new kind of people with new vocabulary and a new attitude to life, new knowledge. Um, and through that, a new kind of advertising, which I think was more informal, less structured, more keen to create a relationship between the advertiser and the consumer. You know, we started talking and we, we didn't say Volkswagen, we said we, you know, it was the client as some more personal than an institution. And, you know, it was Bernbeck who said, you know, 
try and talk to the consumer as though he were your friend, as though you were sitting in a pub and talking about it. And I loved all of that uh, because I have a kind of tendency to, you know, um, pillage my own life and put it into the acts um, in, in an attempt to make a connection. And I just, you know, I felt very comfortable writing in that way um, and looking for those kinds of ideas that made this kind of connection. So, you know, it was a decade of change everywhere, but um, for me, particularly so in advertising, John had a beard, he was an owlish man, professorial. He had a big old Victorian roll-top desk in his office and as he pulled it up, it was stuffed with little medicines of various kinds because strangely he used to get in, um, ultra nervous if he was doing a presentation. Um, but he was a lov lovely, uh, a lovely man to work for. If you took a beat, bit of copy into him before he'd, before it had actually hit the desktop, he was going into his pocket for a pencil. So he, he was the, the idea that he wouldn't have anything to correct never crossed his mind. Um, and he would, uh, you know, go through it word by word, thought by thought, link by link. And he'd tell you where it wasn't working and you'd go back and try and smooth it out. And he'd do this three or four times. He would never actually solve the problem for you. If after four or five times you were getting discouraged and you still hadn't done it, he would do it for you. He'd just say, do this, do that, move that, do that there. And you'd think, how did I miss that? So it was close text editing uh, and um, invaluable. And eventually, after a few months or a year or whatever, you'd come out and maybe he hadn't made a mark on your paper and you did a little skip in the corridor and a hoop. Um, so I learned a, a great deal again from John in New York for six months, but in fact it turned out to be for 11 months or nearly a year. So I sort of, I suppose I went to New York with some credentials. Um, and then, of course, um, I was an office junior again in New York, uh, a temporary resident. Um, but again, I got lucky. I was um, sent to work in Bob Levinson and Leonard Sirowitz's group. And I remember my first morning there. We'd been put into a hotel to stay while we tried to find an apartment to live in. But I had to start work. We arrived on the Friday, I had to start work on the Monday. And I walked into the office and was shown up to Bob Levinson's office. And he was on a pair of stepladders. Uh, he was dressed like a college professor, I remember, in a you know, tie and a sports jacket. Um, and he was banging a nail into the wall and he was hanging up a framed copy of uh, an L ad. Um, with a picture, a line drawing of Noah's Ark. And the headline was, uh, we've been in the travel business a long time. It's just an absolute wonderful ad. And I knew, I used to know the copy by heart. And I just thought, you know, it was like, you know, I suppose a young painter going into the Sistine Chapel and seeing Michelangelo just finishing something. My first ever American ad was, in fact, a dealer ad for Volkswagen. I mean, I had a Volkswagen, and I noticed that if you were driving a Volkswagen, if you met another bug on the road, the driver would go like that. And I wrote an ad that just said, uh, why don't they wave anymore, you know, aimed at dealers. And basically, I made the point that they don't wave anymore because there's just too many of them on the road. It's a very successful franchise and so on. So, Bob and then seemed to like it and um, they gave me some more Volkswagen work to do, even some work aimed at the actual buyers. The interesting thing about it was it was a wonderfully big agency, you know, and that um, debate about can you stay good and be big, I mean, I think DDB in the 60s proved it. Then 66 Christmas party, there were about 1,300 people there. 
And when eventually the phone list came out with my name on it, which I was, you know, really wanted to see just proof that I really was there, I went down and saw Abbott copy. And I realized, I thought, I wonder how many other people got copy after their names. There were 72 writers in that agency. And they were all pretty good. So you just realized, you know, and it, and you know, when I was running my own agency with Peter and, uh, and Adrian, we had this discussion about getting big, you know. Can we still stay good and get big? And I always used to quote DDB, you know, because no place was better than DDB in the 60s. And 1,300 people, 70 creative teams. So you can, but you've got to uh, be fiercely... Um, You've got to have a great fierce devotion to being good. I think all of us you know, working at DDB London was conscious of what DDB stood for. And I remember a brief came in to write a recruitment ad. We were looking for some new account people and nobody wanted to do the ad. So I put my hand up. Um, and I turned it into a DDB philosophy ad. I mean, self-serving in a way, because I didn't want account people to come into the agency who didn't understand what DDB was around. In fact, it turned out into quite a nice little ad. Um, you couldn't avoid the DDB philosophy. It was like, a, you know, like, um, you know, Brighton Rock, you know, the name and the feeling ran right through it. Um, it was part of the way we worked, uh, the relationship with our client, the clients we had. They knew that, um, that um, what the rules were. And of course, when I went to New York, I was even closer to this sort of fountainhead of wisdom and attitude. And um, uh, it was just part of the furniture. It was part of the air we breathed. Um, we wouldn't do speculative um, presentations. Um, we had a firm but honest viewpoint. Uh, we, our ads would be well-mannered. Um, our ads would be um, uh, colloquial, but they would always have an idea. And the idea was usually rooted in the product. That writers were expected to respect the craft that was necessary to create a good ad. So you would rewrite your copy to avoid widows. You would write it to give the art direct uh, just enough to do three columns of eight lines in a Volkswagen ad. Um, it, it was just expected of you and you didn't want to do any less. Um, uh, so the big crime was to be boring. Uh, but there was, you couldn't be noticeable and irrelevant either. You had to uh, come up with work that fitted the brief, but was different, you know, which is easy to say, um, but not easy to do. And that's why, um, um, you know, Doyle Dane did it better than anyone else for a while. We had a new chairman arrive, a man called John Pringle, who was another life force he had been the client of the Jamaica Tourist Board. He was a millionaire who had a, a sugar plantations and he developed a hotel round hill in, in um, Jamaica. And then he retired and he went to live in Switzerland and got bored. And Bill Birnbeck said to him, would you like to come and be chairman of DDB in London? So he did. He, didn't, he knew nothing really about running an agency. But he was a good businessman. The first thing he did was to decide to spend money on our offices. So as a consequence, the agency was losing, lost £165,000, I remember, that year. 
And then John asked me to be managing director, um, which I said, I was, I didn't think I could do it. I didn't think, see myself as a businessman. I didn't, you know, how to read a balance sheet. But he said, it doesn't matter. I just want you to kind of lead the agency. Um, so I did it. And the first thing I decided was that it didn't make sense for the agency to be losing money. Because there's some contradiction that um, I found unacceptable is that if we were saying good ads is good business for our clients, they ought to be good business for us. So I mean, well, so I decided that we had to make start making money, but without compromising anything. I, I, it was easier than I'm making it sound because it, there were extraordinary costs because of the refit. But one of the things I'm most proud of was that in my first year we did make £65,000 profit because I felt that not to make a profit undermined the value of what we were preaching and doing. I quite enjoyed it. Um, I quite liked being in charge. Um, only to the extent that it means that you can protect the things that need protecting and you don't have to... You can take a long you can take a long view if you know what you're aiming for. I can't um, actually remember the very first time I met Bill Burbank. Um, I suspect it was fleetingly in the early days in London when um, I would have just been part of the assembled creative department, kneeling as he came through the front door. Um, no, no, he wasn't at all a pretentious man. In fact, he, he looked like a college professor. He had very small hands, I remember, or it seemed to me in my memory. Um, and later, when I was uh, manager director of Dorday, and I used to meet him more often, and I would always arrange a lunch in the agency so that he could meet, you know, 10 or 12 people, have lunch with him, and he would give us a little talk. And I I remember thinking, as I listened to him at the head of the table, and he would just, you know, make certain small hand gestures, that I thought he was irresistible. I couldn't imagine how a client would not be bowled over by him, and I imagined that they would give him the business straight away. He was very persuasive. And of course he had the most wonderful, real, and track record to show to back up what he said but he was quietly spoken um, he was um, the opposite of a salesman he was as I said professorial in his look and manner and um, a quiet man with a very big stick Though you might not suspect it from his demeanour, he was a, a fiercely passionate man about uh, his agency, um, his beliefs, and his reputation, and the part that he had played in the creative revolution. I remember once uh, at one of the communal lunches uh, I used to host when he was in London. When I say communal, there was about a dozen of us in the boardroom. And he was asked a question by one of the people there, one of the staff is, and the question was, uh, why Mr. Burnback, when we're struggling to you know, grow big in London, do you not let us do uh, what everybody, other agency does, and that is make speculative presentations? And rather foolishly, uh, before Bill had a chance to, so I butted in and said, uh, well, I think the Doyle Dane uh, way about this is, and he took hold of my arm and he went, Doyle Dane, burn back. <laughs> so he was, <laughs> he was more jealous of his being in the name than you would have imagined. But I think that was a kind of sign or something. I mean, he was good-natured about it and it was a joke, but, you know, it's the kind of joke you don't make unless you mean it. Um, he was uh, very, very demanding. Uh, I think once Bill um, 
Bill wanted to run a house ad in the States and he asked Bob Levinson to write it. And um, Bob came out with an ad with the headline, Do This or Die. I think it was very much Bill's brief that it was Bob's execution. And basically he said that the advertising industry, unless it followed these rules of you know, honesty, integrity, uh, not being boring, etc., etc., being relevant, would die, it would become unnecessary. Um, so he was a, a, an apostle, he was, you know, um, a believer. Um, he was the head of um, not only an agency chain, but he was, he was the leader of a creative movement. I think he was aware of his position in the history of advertising and proud of it. And also um, wanted us to use those skills in uh, other areas, you know, which is why he took political campaigns and why he worked for the Salk Institute. I mean, he believed that advertising was a force for good. And whenever I was asked that question, you know, like, why have you decided to spend your life in advertising? Advertising makes people buy things they don't need. I always used to say something that probably was a paraphrase of, a paraphrase of Bill's. I, I used to say, well, we live in a society, for better or for worse, which is a capitalistic society. Uh, we want mass employment. And you can't get mass employment without mass production. And you can't have mass production without some form of mass selling. So it's all part of the social fabric, which has got a lot of benefits. Um, and uh, it fulfills a, a necessary social role. That doesn't mean that I'm in favour of bad advertising. That's the difference. There's nothing wrong with advertising. Nobody actually feels that it's wrong to put an ad in the local newsagent's window saying pram for sale or cleaner wanted. We believe in advertising. What we don't believe in is a tiresome, rude, uh, insulting advertising. So the trick is to try and do advertising that you'd be, that's effective, but also that you'd be uh, proud to own up to. It was during this time at Dordain, Birnbach, London, that um, the Volkswagen campaign came in. And um, initially, I remember Dawson, and I forget who was working with him at the time, but they didn't want to follow the U US model. And uh, I said, well, beard on your head. But they did present some ads to Bill. They were nice ads, but in a different typeface and different tone of voice. And Bill said, absolutely not. So we went back to doing ads, uh, quite right too, it would have been absolutely false pride to have, have uh, changed the campaign. I'm glad we weren't allowed to. I didn't really want to, but, you know, Dawson was a senior player and I didn't want to be too heavy. But it would have been my fault if it had run. But anyway, it didn't, and so we went back and... Brian and I uh, tried to outdo the Americans at Volkswagen ads. And I think once or twice we, we were up there with them. Including, and we did this ad with Marty Feldman, um, a big, close portrait of him, and with a headline that said, uh, if he can make it, so can Volkswagen. The point being, you know, that he's an ugly little chap and the Beetle is an ugly little car. Uh, we didn't put it quite that bluntly to him, but... I do remember showing him the ad and him saying, but you're suggesting I'm ugly. I think he obviously winding me up. So anyhow, somehow I managed to talk my way out of it and he let the ad go. And, um, and it was a very successful ad, one of the most, I suppose, famous ads that Brian and I did. And um, it was also, I think we knew this at the time, and uh, it was a, a courageous ad. I mean, it was courageous. Uh, it's one of those things that you can think outrageous, courageous thoughts, but to actually then go and present them and sell them and make them run, um, you know, is the trick. An ad's not an ad if it stays in your draw. Um, you know, everybody has those ads that um, 
never ran. They're not ads if they never run. So it's that courage to take it right the way through. And I think most great ads or good, very good ads have this element of courage and daring in them. For some reason in 1971, I, I think I can't imagine why really, because I was very happy that I just, somebody came to me, Richard and Mike Gold, Richard French and Mike Gold and said, would you come in with us? Um, I'd been approached over the years, you know, as you probably imagine, by several other people. Um, but I'd always said no, because I couldn't imagine anywhere being nicer than DDB. But I suppose I felt that I could take the DD principles with me, and it would still be DDB, but it wasn't. Um, because I had two other partners who came from different backgrounds and different philosophies. And so uh, FGA was a good agency, but not a great agency. And I felt in the end um, slightly frustrated there. And um, I'm still very good friends with, I see a lot of Richard French, uh, less of Mike, but um, so it was just, um, it was just a bit of a struggle to um, mesh the two of the Kingsley, Mant and Palmer, where they came from, together with the DD partnership. And I don't think we ever really um, really fulfilled uh, ourselves there. So that was six years. So we announced ourselves with a house ad that said, watch out Collets, we're only 30 million behind you, which is what Collets were billing at the time. Um, and I, I, I ran the ad really just to say that I wanted to put us in that company, just to position us as not just another small startup, but somebody who thought, hoped to be as big and as successful as Collets, um, which we, in the end, we proved to be. Um, and we just then got on with building a, a little agency. I mean, one of my reasons for going there was to get back, um, I, I, I think I said in a, some interview that I wanted to just sit in a back room and produce little jewels with Ron Brown, who had I'd hired to come and be my art director. And um, we did toy with, I suppose we were a bit bloody and bowed by, you know, agency life at FGA and all the, we, mer we had merged there with CPV. And there was a lot of, you know, business of, it, it was kind of rather tense and I just wanted to have a quiet life and just do the ads in a back room. And we did talk about only having five or six clients, you know, and we wouldn't take a new client till one dropped off the end, which was naive. And of course, you can't do that. Agencies have to grow. And people who try and stay small, um, it doesn't work because the people who work for you have got to have races as their families grow and they've got to have things to work on. So you have to grow, but you have to grow in the right way. And AMV, um, I think, was it came, well, it came in the right order because it had to come in the right order. It was the agency where I could put into play with Peter and Adrian all the things I'd learned in the other agencies. I was more mature. I knew what was important and what wasn't. And um, we were friends and we felt the same way about what we wanted to do. And what we wanted to do in, was not only to run a good agency, but it was to be happy, personally happy, you know, to love going into work. I'd always loved advertising. I'd always felt that, uh, you know, it was a wonderfully privileged way to, uh, to spend a, a life, you know, working at something you loved. But it, that had slightly got a bit frayed at 
uh, French God Abbot. So I was keen to get back to um, really enjoying my work and the agency. And that, very luckily, is what happened. I mean, I was involved in the running, I suppose, of three agencies. And I never wanted to give up a management role because in the end, it's the people who control the money who um, make the right or wrong decisions. There was a period in the 60s, just going back for a minute, when people were offered enormous salaries from the good agencies to go to the bad agencies. I remember service, there was an agency called Service Advertising, and they offered me at the time three thousand pounds a year to go and work there which at the time was you know um twice as much as i was earning but you know you knew if you went there you'd never do another good ad in your life because despite you know the chairman saying we want you to come here to turn us into a great agency the chairman would not be prepared to fire all his clients <laughs> which he would have to do if he wanted to be a and I remember there was a man called Ron Rosenfeld who left in working in New York, who was a really hot, creative person who went to work for JWT in New York, but he couldn't change JWT. You don't change it. You have to change it from the top. And it, the people at the top signing the checks have to be the people who want the agency to be great and be prepared to take the time and the sacrifices to make it great. So we were not in that position at, at AMV. We all wanted it to be great, and we were the people at the top. And so we could afford to make decisions like, you know, I remember three years into the agency, our big television client was Marshall Cavendish, who did park works. And we were producing 15, 16 films a year for them. But they were never films that were ever going to get us any TV business. You know, they didn't, they were not, on our reel as, as great films. They were great films for a part work and they were very, very successful. But uh, they were our biggest billing client and we let them go because it was um, not a good advertisement. It wasn't taking us where we wanted to go. Um, and only the people who control the money can make those decisions. So I always wanted to be part of management, but I never wanted to give up writing ads, and I never did. I never sat anywhere else but on the creative floor. Uh, I was, there wasn't a management floor. Peter and Adrian sat on separate floors. We didn't want to be like that. We were working management. And I mean, that raises the question of, you know, what, what kind of creative director do you want to be? I was a creative director for 33 years, I think, 34. And I was a creative director who still produced ads. I mean, whether you call that leading from the front, I don't know. But I thought it was always an advantage to still be producing ads. Partly because, you know, they made having people around me good people around me made my ads better and I think I made their ads better just by example but also because I knew how the agency worked as a creator I knew who the good account people were I knew who the who the savvy planners were who was weak who was not I saw the agency you know from the creative floor and since the most important thing we did was the creative product I thought that was the best place to see the agency from but it was also what I wanted to do. And I could only do that by having people around me who were as good or better than me. I mean, creative people. So I, you know, I had people like John and Richard who would have been creative directors at other places. Mark Antoni, who was a creative director. People who were self-reliant so I could have time to do my work. We had a terrible, always had a flat structure. We didn't have a group section. It was me and them and they showed me their work and I showed Richard and John and some other people my work. We made it simple, you know. We were all people who wanted to do good ads and we didn't have structures or politics. We tried to keep politics 
out of the agency. If it showed its head, I would get people in and have a chat with them and say, you know, don't do this. It's not what we do here. Um, you know, occasionally you get a creative team who weren't getting on and the writer would sidle into my office and say, so-and-so is no good, he's holding me back. And I say, well, look, just think about this. I'm happy with the work that you're doing. And the chemistry between writer and art director and how they work is different in every case. If you can't work with him, you come and, and tell me, both of you, and I'll see if I can rejiggle or I'll have to let you go or whatever. I said, but don't you come in. It's, it's, you know, I'm not going to interfere because I'm happy with what you're producing. And so if you were kind of brought people together, if there was a dispute and made them tell you in front of you, uh, it stopped all this backbiting. And because we were determined to make it as far as we could a, a happy place because we wanted to be happy. I didn't want to come in every morning, you know. I mean, the creative teams in particular, but I think it's true of all people who work in a, a good agency. You know, what they do is so, I mean, it is courageous. Every morning they come into their desk and they hope this is the day they're going to do something good. They don't come in to make money, that they do make money, they need the salary. But they come in with that hope that, you know, they're going to do something good today. And management's job is to make that hope come true, you know, not all the time, but there are enough days when they do come in and do something good and that the climate is productive and the way we work, I wouldn't say culture, but the things we believe. Because it's essentially quite a cynical audience, you know, they've been bitten so many times, they've listened to so many management speeches about what we're going to do. Um, what we believe in, and then the agency behaves in a way that makes that a blatant and obvious lie to these people, you know. They do accept clients who bully them, they do pass campaigns that are, you know, insulting, um, and they get disenchanted, and they get unhappy, and they start talking in the corridors, um, and morale goes down. So. You make a contract with them as management that, uh, and you can't break that contract. So even when things are going right, wrong, you know, and you lose a piece of business or you go for a while without winning new business, as long as the people who work for you believe that you are still trying, that you haven't given up, they'll stay, you know. And people stayed with us for years and years and years. We, we kept a lot of good creative people who probably could have earned more money. Well, we didn't actually, we paid well. We were one of the, because again, why should you penalize people just because you've got their loyalty and decide to pay them less? Um, it's, a, you know, it's a complex job and yet a very easy job. I think I once said it's very easy to run a, a good agency. You just cram the place full of talented people and you look after them. And that's essentially, that's essentially the recipe, I think. In advertising, you know, people have tried to find a formula, you know, the USP, the Universal Selling Proposition. Um, I don't, I think these are not really formulas, they're just selling tricks that agencies come up with, you know, a way of packaging what they're offering. But I don't think there's one single thing that leads you to produce only successful ads. Um, what I believe in, and it has influenced my hiring policy over the years as well, I look for people who are able to make a connection on behalf of a client or institution, a client, with the intended audience. And by that I mean, it, I would say that it has to be a human connection, um, something that uh, um, creates a link. It's usually 
an insight that somebody else has not had or not expressed in a particular way. So, if I was interviewing, I would look first. F I would look for intelligence, but I would also look for curiosity, an interest in people. Uh, that generally meant people who were interested in films or novels or, or biography or what was. People who were curious about the human condition. And then I think it's the agency's task to give them an environment where that intelligence and that human, humanity, that curiosity, can flourish. Um, that means that we have to find clients who uh, will appreciate what we're offering. And um, I always felt we were not an agency for everyone. And um, I was as careful about choosing a client as the client was careful about choosing an agency. But not many <laughs> agencies put it like that. You know, we're not all out there trying to get what you know, any client that will pay us money. We were out there looking for clients that would um, give us a fair living, but also needed what we had to offer and valued what we had to offer. And I couldn't do that without a body of like-minded people. So that's what I look for in hiring. And I think that's what we... Um, offered our clients, this particular blend of knowing that we had to spend their money in a noticeable way, but also wanting to make connections, uncommon connections that other agencies didn't worry about. I mean, it's one of the reasons our agency was often called by some people sentimental. Um, so the Father's Day ad, or the for Shivers, or the J.R. Hartley ad, and series of ads for Yellow Pages, um, rarely got awards in this country. Sometimes they didn't even get in the book. So those two examples did. But I mean, I wouldn't call them sentimental. I would call them full of sentiment. And sentiment, I think, in whatever you're selling, is a powerful tool. Um, and so um, I think Bill Birnbach believed in that as well. Ogilvy kind of believed in it as well when he said the consumer isn't a more and she's your wife, you know. You bring it down to the audience. And if you read newspapers and if you read magazines and you watch television, you know that's what it's that human connection that's kind of... People don't watch soaps just because they're on the television. They watch them because they like stories about relationships and life. And so um, that's what I think marked out A and B in particular. Um, but it, you can trace that desire back to burn back. Yes, there was a particular thing that Bill Birnbeck said once, which was that uh, a small admission gains a large acceptance in communication. And I think that's a very powerful thought. Uh, and it's why, if I was making a speech, I would always start with a self-deprecatory story or two at the beginning. Uh, because it sets up, you know, this guy is not trying to sell me something. This guy is not going to give me 10 or 15 minutes of bombast and things. And then, you know, if I, I usually was trying to sell something, I was usually trying to sell <laughs> the agency. But to appear that you're selling is a disadvantage. Um, uh, we don't like it in people we meet, and why would should we like it in an ad we come across? Um, it's not good manners. Uh, the British in particular don't like hard on, you know, foot in the door salesmanship. So if you can just say, I know this is, yeah, I know you probably don't want this, but, you know, I don't know, would you mind just, you know, reading this and we'll make it fairly entertaining and, um, yeah, 
it's maybe not for you but you know you kind of have a different way of um uh, of getting your message across um and that's what uh, that was the kind of um mood of the agency and mood of the people who work there you know i had wonderful people around me but i don't think um you know they were all very quietly aware of their worth but none of them was bombastic or it wasn't the tone of the place or the tone of our advertising. And I don't think it's that, well, maybe the world is changing a bit these days, but it wasn't the tone of the British public, our audience, that they it wasn't the tone they appreciated. DMV, we were a very early adopter of planning. I believed in it. At Dordain, we had a research director um, who fulfilled pretty much the same function, but without groups, really. I suppose that's the difference. But we thought planning was useful. Um, and planners were bright, uh, usually, um, necessary people in the process. But you have to be careful with, with planning. And I think as the years went by, you have to be watchful that they don't take on themselves the responsibility of, you know, being the only thinking part of the agency. And um, we, we, like other planning agencies, had to guard against that because there's a process where new business prospect comes in, you you sit and listen. I'm there, planners are there, Peter or agents there. Probably no other creative person is there. You listen, they hand over their brief, and then in a modern agency, or when I was there, the planning department would take the client's brief and say, I'll come back to you, you know, and they'd sort out the brief, and they'd come back with a creative brief and their conclusions. And if you're not careful, you know, three weeks go by, you've only got six weeks, and three weeks have been taken up the planners questioning the client's brief. And you don't have time if you disagree with their interpretations, you know. And so, if you're not careful, you're stuck with, you know, something you haven't been part of. So I always used to guard against this by, A, taking the client's brief myself, because there became a kind of arrogance in advertising, which is that you had, the first thing you had to do was rip, a, rip apart the client's brief and write your own brief because the client has got it wrong. I always used to start from the basis that the client knows probably more about his business than we do. And that we ought to, I always wanted to know the client's brief in detail because if we were going to refute it, we couldn't just say you're wrong. We ha you had to find some very good reasons uh, to say we don't want to do what you think is what we should be doing. Um, and I always used to feel that if you cut people, you know, creative people out or media people or anybody else out of the thinking process, you're only using part of the agency's resources and their good brains. So we tried not to let the planners, which was their tendency, even at A&V, to go away and solve the problem on their own, we would intrude and stop that happening. And I did find that quite often, you know, they did um, want to throw out the client's brief, sometimes rightly, sometimes not rightly. Uh, the other thing I used to do, and I, I, I used to li listen very carefully to the client presenting the brief. And then if there was an intermediate meeting, I used to listen very carefully to that and watch. And if in a meeting you watch rather than talk and listen rather than talk, you can see when a point strikes home with a client or when they disagree with a client. You know, there's just body language tells you, that, you know. As there some clients are poker faces, but mostly you can come away from that meeting at least knowing what where the client is 
And that, you know, if you're going to have to sell him off something, it's going to be a hard sell. Or if you've said something that he agrees with, you know that information. And so you, that's all data as far as I'm concerned to solving the problem. Because the problem is doing the right thing for the client. That's half the problem. The second half of the problem is getting the client to accept that it's the right thing for him. So you've got to know everything. So we believed in planning, but we were not. I, I, and occasionally I had to write uh, memos about this and fight for the fact that, you know, that I didn't want uh, briefs going to the creative department that were prescriptive. I wanted them to pro to tell us what the problem was, what we had to solve it. I didn't want them to tell the creative department how to solve it, which is area they usually quite often strayed in. So, for example, on the Economist campaign, the actual brief was quite simple, you know, it was just, you know, how do we make the Economist a central part of, you know, the thinking man or woman's um, uh, reading? Or, or more blatantly, you know, read the Economist and be successful. Um, it said dangers to avoid, you know, don't be too elitist, etc., etc. And the brief changed slightly over the years. But what we arrived at was not in the brief. I mean, I knew what the problem was because it was a very simple problem, but I didn't know how to solve it until I solved it, you know. And that was posters and one-liners and not contents, and it was the way it was. It was tone of voice. Um, and a planner, you know, if a planner had been too specific, either media choice or... You know, there's a dummy line of, you know, you know, they could have sent the creative department down a non-productive way. You had to leave it as open as you could for the unexpected insight or thought. But I did used to hope that the planners would come up with an insight. An insight followed, uh, followed by a wonderful execution was the strongest formula. But something about, some connection that nobody else had made. And I look for that in all our new business presentations. I think there's a difference between sentimentality and sentiment. I try and avoid the former, not always successfully, I'm told. Um, but I do believe in putting yourself into your advertising. And I've tried to impart this to other copywriters. If you feel something, there's a chance that other people will feel it too. And so I encourage uh, the people who work for me um, to put themselves into their work. Um, in America, I would probably not have been accused of being sentimental because their advertising is, uh, by and large, um, not afraid of, of sentiment. Uh, some of the early Doyle Dane New York ads that I love most were for Polaroid. There's a wonderful film of uh, a family, mother, father, and a couple of children saying goodbye to their grandparents. And um, they're in the train, and the train's about to pull out from this sort of fairly rural station. And the mother has got a camera out on the platform. And as the train draws away, got to be careful, I'll start welling up. As the train pulls out, she takes a picture of the parents at the window. And you see the picture develop for six, 60 seconds. And then you see this picture of the grey-haired couple looking out of the window, their faces. And I found it overwhelming. Um, the music was right. The words are very simple. I think at the end it said something like Polaroid, you know, because time is always slipping away or something like that. But, you know, incredibly powerful. And why wouldn't you use those tools? But it's done, you know, in a very classy, restrained way. It's underplayed, but it's strong and real. 
And why would advertising turn its back on all those uh, things? I mean, I've got the Shivers Regal ad in, a, in one of the Sunday colour supplements. I'll show it to you later. And you turn the page and you come across it, and it's very powerful. Uh, I turn on 20 or 30 more pages, and there's a photograph of a very famous photograph of a Vietnam major or kind of coming off the plane and his children rushing across the tarmac to jump into his eye, arms. And that's, that's really powerful. You know, that's the human condition. And so my ad in the front, I think, is a good ad, a powerful ad, but it's not as powerful as the real thing. And so we all try and make advertising get as close as it can to the real thing. I mean, yes, you've got to use it in a relevant way for a product that can actually fulfill this promise. But, you know, there was a period in British advertising when the only thing the creative community valued was humour. And that was particularly so on radio, you know inane conversations. Nobody ever tried to do anything other than a humorous duologue on the... And uh, I just always thought we're missing out on the most important part of our common humanity just to avoid anything that is meant to move you. I mean, one of my favorite ads I ever wrote, a television commercial for British Telecom, is a locked off camera on a small bungalow, neat suburban bungalow uh, in the suburbs. Camera stays locked off, and I can't remember the words, but I'm sure you'll get hold of the film. But it's about, I think the copy says, there's appropriate music, the camera stays still, the weather changes, but it's about, you know, it's nobody's birthday, I think the copy starts. Um, um, nothing has happened. Uh, the cat still walks across the wall. The milkman comes and goes. The windows glisten. Friday is stay, still big shop day. And you see a little old car come back in, an aged couple get out with their shopping bags um, and go inside, and they hear the phone ring. And, but the point of the commercial is ring home uh, because it means so much more when you don't have to. Nothing has happened. It's not an emergency. Life goes on. It's nobody's birthday. Nobody's sick. The car gets washed. The car gets dirty. The windows gleam as always. The milkman comes and goes. The cat still walks on the wall. Friday is still main shop day. Is that the phone? Ring home. Because it means even more when the only reason you do it is because you want to. I mean, I'm proud of that because it's a piece of life. It fits in with its good to talk. Um, and it's kind of got a kind of eternal, if not to be too pompous about it. But, you know, but it will always be true. It's just a piece of truth. And if you're trying to get people to make more phone calls, which is the only way BT at the time could increase its income because it had 95% coverage. So the name of the game commercially was getting people to use the phone more often. But, you know, that's more effective than doing an ad about weekday tariffs, I think. And our agency used to think. And fortunately, the client did as well. Buy one Sainsbury's salmon steak per person. Lightly butter two pieces of cooking foil. Now slice a medium onion. Put a couple of rings on the foil. Add some fresh Sainsbury's dill. Place the salmon on top. 
squeeze a little lemon and add a knob of butter. Season, wrap the salmon up and bake in a medium oven for 20 minutes. Meanwhile, empty six ounces of Sainsbury's fromage frais into a bowl. Finally, chop one bunch of watercress and add it to the fromage frais. Mix thoroughly and season. Remove the salmon from the foil and serve with new potatoes and the watercress sauce. It's very simple. It's very tasty. Sainsbury's, everyone's favorite ingredient. I think the recipe campaign we did on television for Sainsbury's at A&B was very daring, even though the actual format of it is a traditional in the sense that we're doing recipe. But no supermarket had spent 60 seconds of airtime um, giving away a recipe. Now, it's true that we used Sainsbury's products, but we used a lot of generic products at all that weren't branded. Um, normally, the supermarket wouldn't take 60 second ads. Um, and the courage really was actually presenting it to them at a time when we were a bit under the cosh and they were threatening to take the TV away from us and leave us with the press. And I'd been to see the marketing director and I'd said, you should understand, Robin, that if you take the TV away from us, we will resign the print. We don't want just to be, you know, half an agency for a supermarket. We think we're good enough to look after a whole supermarket. And I said, I think we've got an idea uh, that you will like. And we made a pilot film because I knew they wouldn't understand from a storyboard what I was trying to do, which was to, you know, have something of the joy of cooking, you know, and the music and the wonderful close photography, just the sheer appetite appeal of it. And then we put on top of it the celebrity element where you only heard the celebrity's voice and then there was a reveal at the end. So it was kind of plucky, A, to think it, but even more plucky to take it through and to show it and to risk the account on it. And I think that's true of all campaigns, you know, Avis, not just the ones that we did, but all around, you know, Levi's, a lot of the work that Collins did. Um, it always takes some daring, you know, to change the format. I mean, me lying under the car was a kind of, you know, that was turned down twice by the client. The first time I presented the ad, it had a baby under it. And the client said, oh, no, just the thought of it falling onto a baby. I said, you know, if the, if the welding isn't strong enough, it will fall on the baby. So the following presentation uh, in the autumn, I went back with the same ad and I had the welder lying under the car. And he said, if the welding isn't strong enough, the car will fall on the welder. And the factory involved because it broke the health and safety rules, putting a so the next time I went back, I had me lying under the car and nobody objected at all. Uh, but, you know, it's just being determined, if you've got an idea, just to, to push it and find a way of, uh, of making it run. And there are some teams you have who have that kind of desire just to, you know, they know they've got to come up with something a little bit different, something that pushes the category a little bit further. And those are the people you treasure. And of course, you hope that you're one of them. But, um, and daring, you know, doesn't have to mean outrageous. It, it, it's, it's just things where you think, my God, I don't think we'll get away with this. We won't sell it. We won't get it through, but you do. One of the really good things that happened at FGA, French Cold Abbott, was that I met the Volvo client and we got the Volvo business. And when I left, there was a man called Jim Maxman, who was an American, a guitar playing American, who was um, uh, not Swedish in any way at all. Uh, quite a lively man. And basically he gave us the business. Um, and when I decided to leave, and 
go in with Peter Mead and Adrian Vickers and start, reform ourselves as Abbot Mead Vickers. Um, I said, I told Jim and he said, well, I don't know whether we can come with you. I said, well, I don't really want you to come with me, Jim. And that's not why I'm telling you, it's just to say goodbye. Um, because at that point, Volvo had decided in Sweden on a new strategy. They were going to, they wanted to abandon safety, longevity, dependability and try and tackle the problem of appearance and sexiness. And I'd said to them, look, the car isn't <laughs> or sexy and however many ads I run saying it isn't, you know, people will believe their eyes and I don't think I can do that. And that was still the situation when I'd left. So Jim said, well, we've taken a vote on whether to follow you. And it's 2-2, two, two, and I don't, there are four directors, and I don't think I can, um, I can't force anyone. So, so off I went to AMV. In January, which was in November 77, in January 78, I had a phone call from Jim saying that someone's left, it's now 2-1. So, do you want the business? I said, I don't want the business if it's still the old brief. He said, no, it isn't. They've got over that nonsense. It's back to Volvo Virtues. So I said, yes, please. And so that was, uh, that was a great break for AMV. It couldn't have come at a better time because uh, we'd, uh, Peter had, one of Peter's existing clients had defaulted. And, and, and so it was a, a, a good, a good win, and of course we then went on to have another 20 years with Volvo at AMV. Often within a client you have, you have the need to do kind of sub-campaigns. And I remember on Volvo, uh, the top of the line car um, was quite expensive. Um, in a prestigious area of the market, they were hoping to sell against you know, some of the Mercedes models and the BMW models, but it was still a Volvo. But it was a very well-specced Volvo. And that was really, if you, that was really the point of difference, that you could have all these comforts, all this air conditioning, all this, but in a Volvo with its dependable, long life qualities. Um, so I had to find a way of um, getting this across. Uh, I could have printed a list of, you know, all the standard features, but it would have been rather dull and not very Volvo. So I used a kind of story, narrative format, the whole page ads that looked as though they, they were in fact, between 900 and 1,000 words each, and they were really little short stories um, about, sometimes it was about a hitchhiker asking for a Volvo, and I could create a little story about that. And within that story, I think I mentioned every single stat feature of note in the Volvo. Uh, but I hope not in a boring list-like way. Go quite tricky writing. But oh, and another one was about a man who met somebody in a Volvo showroom he'd been at university with, who turned out to be the owner of the showroom. Um, another one was about somebody who broke down and was in an expensive car and was picked up on a by somebody in a Volvo and he hated Volvos and um, so they get into conversations they were all kind of you know sort of um, upper class chaps and ladies one about a man who just got married second marriage who had the bride's relatives had tied tin cans cans onto the back of his Volvo and he was worried about them chipping the paintwork and she got uppity with him. So I think they were all nice little stories, but they were different. And it was that thing about daring to do it, daring to go to the client and, you know, but I persuaded him that 
and he could see the sense of it. It was a way of getting people to read a list, basically, but a palatable way. And yeah, I'm, in fact, um, I got rung up by a publisher who, um, this was in the days when I wasn't ever thinking of writing books, uh, saying to me, you know, they showed promise and did I want to write fiction for them? <laughs> so. Then I was one of the few uh, writers who liked working in radio um, because I think uh, you know, the words really do count in radio. And I did a pastiche of a Betjeman read by Alan Bennett, which I would love to hear again because I remember feeling very proud of it at the time. And um, so there are lots of little nooks and crannies of my uh, working life where um, I'm sure I'd have a fond reunion with bits and pieces of work if they ever surfaced again. Now the truth is I pretty much enjoyed most of the things I did. The Sainsbury's campaign was a uh, print campaign. It was one of those kind of gifts from the gods. I was, the agency wasn't very old, a few months old, six months maybe, and I got a phone call from, my secretary put it through and said, there's somebody from Sainsbury's on the phone. So I thought it was my local Sainsbury's, something had gone wrong, you know, some delivery wasn't going to happen or something. And in fact, it turned out to be from Peter Davis, who was the marketing director of Sainsbury's, who I'd never heard of. And he said, um, I wonder if you'd um, like to come and visit a Sainsbury's shop store with me. So I said, absolutely. He said, I have in mind a project that you might find interesting. So I met Peter in the store in Putney. We walked around the store and he told me, he said, we're doing a print campaign at the moment with Sarches, you may have seen it. And of course I said, no, I haven't, um, being competitive. And um, he said, well, we think that it's not quite the tone we're looking for. And he said, I wondered whether you could do some ads. And he said, um, I'm going away for three weeks on holiday. And when I come back, do you think you'd be in a position to, um, you know, show me some work? So I said, and he gave me a contact number, you know, in his office to talk to and get some briefs. So that's what happened. And when he came back, he liked what we did. And he gave us the um, print campaign, took it away from Sarches and gave it to us. They still retained the television at the time. And we didn't initially, well, the brief was pretty specific. He wanted to uh, talk about quality because Sainsbury's has been forced into fighting Tesco's and others on price. And he was rather worried that the emphasis on price was um, destroying their quality image. And he had some research evidence. So he said, in the print, I think we can talk about the food and the quality and the rest of it. So that was the brief. Um, and so I started meeting up with buyers and trying to find out what made each product line good or not what was special about it. And I would then choose the ones that I thought would make an ad. And that was really the formula for the campaign for the next, I don't know, six, five, six years that it ran. Um, probably 12, 15 executions a year. So we ended up writing about 60 or 70 of them. Um, the first campaign, we used illustrations. We used to take a photograph and then turn it into a illustration because I thought it made the ads look more distinctive. But in fact, I was totally wrong. It um, made the ads look totally unreal. Um, so after about four or five ads, I said, this is a mistake. We should just go back to great photography. It's, you know, it's, it, what, what were we doing? We were mad. So that's what we did. And, and then we just went on meeting the buyers and, choosing which ones we wanted to select and do. And they started, I mean, they were enormously successful. I mean, we ran an ad for Mango, 
it's that you know, I think they were selling a thousand cases a week and it went up to you know like 20,000 cases a week they all work they always work so and of course there's nothing a retailer likes more uh, so though they were doing a branding job and a quality job they actually sold product and um, they wanted a big, I mean, one of the first discussions I had with them was they wanted a big super size logo. And I said, I don't want to do that because it won't be quality if we do make it look like every other. I said, but I'll tell you what, in exchange for that, I'll try and get Sainsbury's into every headline. So that was the trade-off. And if you look at them, there are not many ads that don't have Sainsbury's in the headline. But I didn't have to have, you know, a 40-point logo at the bottom of the page. Um, and those are the kind of deals you can do with clients. If you know what their worries are and you know their anxieties, you know, they're paying for the ad. I mean, I was always, you know, I was never saying we won't do it. I try and find a way of solving their problem. And they, of course, they don't know how to solve the problem. They just say, I want the logo bigger. That's not what they really mean. They want to make sure that the people know this is a Sainsbury's ad. That's what they're really saying, not make the logo bigger. You've got to be smart enough to work that out. Um, and again, we did what I uh, what I said many times before. We gave them a common look. And you could recognise a Sainsbury's ad. And they built up to be an army of ads rather than just all these individual ads. Um, it was very satisfying. Um, and there are many ads I like. I like from White the ad that talks about uh, you can uh, move from a house to a chateau for one pound sixty, and they had a picture of a small, modest house on the house red, and then the chateau on the premium one. So, you know, there was always a way to make it interesting. Um, I love the grapefruit ad where the um, They'd found a new canning method where the canned fruit tasted more like the real fruit. So we lifted the lid of the can and lifted the lid of, we took, you know, sliced the grapefruit so that it also had a lid, you know, and just nice little visual um, things. And I think Ron and I were, nobody else did them for four or five years. So, I mean, they, whatever quality they had, we, we were responsible and for whatever mistakes they made, we were responsible for those as well but overall I think the quality was pretty good we kept it going for a long time and they never stopped working but you know new marketing director comes in the same day and they drop them uh, as they drop the recipe campaign on television which is a great great shame but um, it's one of the features of advertising life is that Every new marketing deck director wants to make his, his or her own mark on the company and they don't want to go on supporting somebody else's good idea. They want to have their own good idea. Um, but someone in the company is used, ought to say, you know, this campaign is an asset, you know, like our stock of shops, uh, you know like money in the bank and uh, I'm not going to let you change it until it stops being an asset but they don't you know most management aren't aren't aware aren't aware of how valuable their image is and how um, and how um, fragile it is too if you stop supporting it you know I mean Economists stop doing red ads, and I don't think they're as top of mind as they were when we were doing them. And why stop? You know, it wasn't very much money, you know. But um, you know, Sad. madness. There's one thing I have kind of noticed and observed in a long career in advertising is that. When a new client comes in and invites you to pitch for their business, they usually give you four, five, sometimes three, but generally not more than six weeks to do it. Uh, so you find out as much as you can about their situation and you present the campaign. And then, if you're lucky, you're their client. And then you have to 
do the proper advertising. Sometimes it's what you did in the pitch. Uh, quite often it's not and you start again, but you have to get it done in four or five months for the next spring or autumn campaign. And it isn't very long, actually, to learn about the client. And so I've observed that, it was certainly true of our agency, that it was often not in the first year that we actually solved the problem. You know, we did some decent ads, but it was in year two or even sometimes a bit later than that, we actually came out with a defining campaign. It takes time to know the company and time to get into the swing. And that was the case in the Economist campaign. Um, because we didn't start with uh, you know, the well-known red poster campaign. We started with a series of quite nice ads, but they didn't really gel into a campaign. And, um, and I was aware of that, and so was the client. And uh, so I had this pressure uh, on myself and from the client to try and get something that was more cohesive. Um, we'd won awards for you know some of the ads that we'd done, and the client was pleased, but we hadn't come up with a defining campaign which he wanted. You know, he wanted us to do a Volvo or a Sainsbury for the Economist, and I recognised that we hadn't done it. And I was sitting in my office pondering about this, and I had a copy of the Economist on my desk. And I looked at the masthead and it was shaped exactly like a 48 sheet post and it was red. I thought, maybe we should put them on posters, uh, red posters. And that was the genesis of that campaign. And then I wrote the first ad, I never read The Economist, management trainee aged 42, quite quickly. And somehow I had found the tone of voice. And I called Ron in and I said, what do you think of this? And I said, we're going to have to make these, you know, we're not, we can't do these. We're going to have to print them. We've got, but they've got to be the proper red and proper set. So then we went in, you know, trying to find the typeface and uh, we wrote more lines. And um, I think we went to the Economist with six or seven poster treatments. And I have to say that, you know, they were, uh, they totally saw it straight away. I mean, it was one of the easiest sells I've ever had in advertising. And um, that was it. I mean, it was just that. And we had, um, we had solved the problem of a sort of consistent brand. And it solved a lot of problems because um, The Economist had a rather long procedural approval uh, procedure, I should say, and um, like eight people had to tick it because we were often talking about in other ads about you know their philosophy, you know, the contents of that particular issue. This way, I mean, it was just one line that had to be approved, and the managing director and the advertising people thought they could do that without conferring with the editor. Um, so there it was. I mean, it was just that flash that made me think of posters. I then immediately rang the media department and had a conversation with them about could we justify it? You know, did it make sense for them? And we were able to justify it. Now, I think the client would have bought it even if it wasn't justified uh, because it was famous. Well, after two or three years of, um, you know, just plain sentences on white, quite rightly, some of the other teams I had introduced onto the account wanted to do things slightly different. So, you know, we had, we had one ad, um, you know, that John and Richard did. This John Horton and Richard Foster were a very senior creative team at the agency and they did an ad that, but that was half blue and half red and it said, uh, half the world is covered with oceans, the other half is covered by, you know, but all the world is covered by the re economy. Anyhow, but we've started playing graphic games. Not too many, because I think it had to essentially be a, um, be a um, word campaign. And then a t Ralph, um, Paul Brigginshaw and Malcolm Duffy, creative team at the agency, came in and showed me an ad that they'd done on the top of a bus, which was a brilliant idea, because the top of a bus is also like a 48-sheet poster. And um, I think the line they came in with was, uh, 
to our friends on the top floor. And I felt that that didn't um, quite express what they were trying to say, which is, you know, to the important people who have got the office. On. So anyhow, I suggested that why didn't they think about to our friends in high office, which um, I thought I'd done my sort of creative director's job and they went away and that's the way it ran. But then they were gracious enough to put me down as co-writer uh, when they entered it for some award in New York, which we got. So I picked up a, another pencil for not doing very much, really. Your champagne, Mr. Burnside. Thank you. You're sitting in seat 2A. I wonder who will be sitting next to you in seat 2B. Your seat, sir. Hey. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. It's Henry Kissinger. Ready for a good chat? We did, after a few years, we thought the client was keen to see whether or not we could take the same spirit over into television. And Richard Foster and John Horton did a nice commercial about an interview. And then the following year, I, I did the Kissinger film, which was, again, going back to having daring thoughts. I mean... Who would have thought that you get Henry Kissinger to appear in an advertisement? But we um, we approached him, and he said he he'd do it uh, if we'd make if the Economist would make a contribution to a favourite charity. And we all flew over to New York. He liked the script, and um, he came storming in one morning and said, "I've only got an hour," and um, but in fact he stayed for three or four hours. Um, Peter Lavelle, the director, made him happy. And we had, the Economist client was Chantel, who was a particularly attractive blonde lady. And uh, some inspiration made us say, would you go and talk to Henry and keep him happy? And he agreed to stay for quite a long while. There, there were, of course, people in the agency good writers who couldn't write a shiver sad. And there were people in the agency, uh, this is going back to Doyle Dane, who couldn't write a Volkswagen ad. They would just didn't have that tone of voice in them. I mean, I never thought that made them bad writers. It was just they weren't good writers on Volkswagen or they weren't good writers on shivers. Not everyone can do that, you know, they can't. Uh, it's just not in them. They don't have that tone within them. Um, so um, I think that's why there are, you know, good and bad shiver sads, because sometimes I think some of them, even the ones we got through, don't quite have the tone right. They're either slightly too heavy handed or too, you know, it's not subtle enough. My, but, my, but some people couldn't do them at all. I mean, one of my favourite ones, because I think it contains... Uh, it's, course one I did um, because I think it contained and it was the first one I ever wrote for Shivers which was the, the headline was funny how people forget to remove the price tag and it um, shows the bottle of Shiver with a little I forget what it was now 78 shillings or something written on it um, and I, I, the copy starts like something it's the thought that counts of course but have you noticed how the more expensive the thought, the more it seems to count. No wonder then that people, you know, tend to leave the price on a bottle of shivers. And then I say it's totally unnecessary because, you know, it's obvious from the value inside that you've been. You know. But I mean, I, was, I, you know, that's a kind of off-field thought based on human observation, um, you know, and um, so it's it's one of my favourite ads. But some people couldn't do it in the agency. Um, and so, you know, we gave them other things to work on. It's, um, so it's, it's partly how you think and how you write, you know. I don't think, um, I'm not gonna name names, but, um, you know, because uh, on accounts like Shivers and The Economist at AMV, uh, I used to let 
I mean, I st you know, the people who started off the campaign would do it for three or four years or whatever it was. But then, you know, because it was a nice campaign, I, I opened it up to any everyone in the creative department. And everyone tried to do their economist poster, and I used to collect a big pile. And um, you know, we needed to get down to five or six concepts, but um, some people could, and some people couldn't. So, but I know it's one of Tony Brignall's. Um, great virtues and something he really believes in that as a writer that um, finding the correct tone of voice for each client um, is important. I think that's true uh, as well. Uh, I think you arrive at it kind of instinctively if you've got that, you know, I've got that kind of brain as I think Tony has. When the uh, RSPCA came to see us, um, they came with a, with a mission, as it were, and they chose us because they wanted to become a campaigning organisation as well as, you know, a, um, as a caring organisation because they, I think it's the old thing, prevention is better than cure. And one of the issues that they came to us, and I think this was the sort of the test issue that they gave to all the agencies who were competing for the business, was the problem of there were about half a million or more um, homeless dogs running around the country, and the RSPCA uh, couldn't feed them when they were captured and brought in. They had to kill them. And this was upsetting, you know, it's a, it's a preservation society, not a killing society. And they wanted us to create a campaign that influenced public opinion and politicians so that the dog license could be reinstated because they firmly believed that you know, if you had a license and could be traced, you would not dump your dogs when Christmas was over. Um, or when you couldn't feed them or just got bored with them. And so that was the brief, I mean that, just that. So uh, part of the information is that they were killing a thousand dogs a day. And this is quite interesting. It's, I think it's been at the root of quite a lot of my ads and the way that the agency felt about things. Information is information unless you dramatise it. But when you dramatise just something that appears in a piece of paper, it, it's very rich area. You know, like when I read that the weld in a Volvo, you know, could support the weight of the entire car, it just passes over you. But if I lie myself under the car supported on one weld, it becomes dramatic. And I said to Ron when I looked at it, I said, "Why don't we show a thousand dead dogs?" I mean, which is, again, going back to another thing I believe in, that's a daring thought. A, it's unpleasant. B, how do you do it practically? And what is the client going to see this pile of dogs? Anyhow, so we found, we, sh we did the concept, and, and it was the sort of lead ad in the campaign that we presented for the business, and we got it on the basis of being that bold and provocative, because that's, they needed to, they didn't have a huge budget, but they needed to make a stir. And then we had the problem of doing it. So Ron went off to a dog cemetery, crematory. And in fact, the ad is about 150 de dead dogs, which is montage. And if you look carefully, you can see that some of the, some of the dogs repeat themselves, the same breed. Um, then I wrote the copy and, um, it, and we put a coupon in it so there was a response mechanism. And it was a very powerful ad and we took double page spreads and what we had then were broadsheet papers. So it was a stonking big ad and an unforgettable image, I think. But um, I think, you know, creative teams should be encouraged to look for a relevant fact that if you illustrate it, you know. Another example of that is the Volvo cotton wool poster. You know, I just, I think we were sitting together one day and I said, 
you know, you know that phrase about wrapping your kids in cotton wool. Do you think we could show a boy, you know, you know, wrapped in cotton wool? And there's the ad, you know. Um, and that's a good trick. That's a good trick to remember that, um, you know, use the data, but illustrate it. The father's day ad was for Shivas Regal, which is um, an ad I'm still pleased with. Um, I remember the day it appeared in the Sunday Times. I was living in Blackheath at the time. The children were all at home, still going to school. I think my daughter must have been about 13 or 14. And she'd got hold of the colour supplement and was leafing through. And I saw she'd reached the Shivas. I was on the other side of the table and I saw her look at this. She knew Shivas was one of our clients. I could see her reading it. I waited for her to look up and said, this is good, Dad. And she looked up and she said to me, she said, God, she said, you think this is the way we feel about you, don't you? So, so, well, I do, actually. Yes, I was kind of hoping that some of it would uh, ring true. Um, and that ad was, having decided to do it that way, then, of course, yeah, I mean, it is very personal in as much as it's a... I did once have a red Raj bicycle as a boy uh, and some of the things in there, are, you know, relate to my father. Some are totally invented and some relate to some of the things that happened between me and my children. And um, again, it goes back uh, to my belief that if you put yourself into the ad, it rings true. And I remember the following morning, my Volvo client rang up time a man called Trevor Chin who owned the franchise for Volvo in the UK at the time and he said it was you know fantastic ad and and he said so he picked out two or three because is that related to him and his father Rossa Chin uh, who started the Lex franchise and other people have said you know chosen other things other sentences that relate to them so I suppose you know there was enough of them for people to lock on to the ones that meant something to them. Which I think is a, you know, a clue of the, the ad was potent, that there was enough in it for most people to find something that um, made them feel warm to their dad. John Condren was the um, managing director of Yellow Pages when they came into um, uh, brief us uh, to ask if we wanted to pitch and he, always, he used to tell the story of I seemed disinterested in the meeting he said David was sitting there almost rolling a pencil down his nose you know head back thinking but I was actually thinking about the campaign and listening to him and I more or less thought of the campaign sitting in that room it does happen sometimes um, but it came out of the brief. Uh, the present advertising was let your fingers do the walking with that jingle. They were mostly used as a directory for emergency services, you know, plumbing, disasters, domestic disasters. But they made their money by persuading the people who got free listings to pay for display ads. That's where the profits came from, you know, so... And a lot of their categories were very underused. Uh, people didn't believe that Yellow Pages was used to find a bookshop, for example, or a garden nursery or a flying school or whatever. So the strategy was to try and persuade, as it were, the people who got free listings that it was worth their while to take a display ad. So we were advertising to the trade, as it were, over the customer's shoulder. And so that, the, the, and I thought of the phrase, good old yellow pages, we're not just there for the nasty things in life, we're there for the nice things too in the meat. So then it just became a matter of illustrating that. So I thought about the nice things in life, the things that we're going back to 
a point I frequently make is that, you know, bring humanity into it. And one of them was J.R. Hartley, and there was another father trying to buy a bike for a surprise bike for his son, and there was a father with a railway kit and a kid looking for a birthday present for this railway model railway enthusiast. And um, so I wrote scripts very quickly, the J.R. Hartley one, I think, overnight. One of the things I haven't mentioned about trying to be a writer and part of manager and creative director was that you, you did a lot of work at home at night time. <laughs> and um, I came in, I think, almost the next morning with the J.R. Hartley script. Uh, it was one of those lucky pieces of writing where I started it without knowing the ending. I didn't know it was the author looking for the book when I started. It was just a guy looking for a book. And then I realised it was poignant if you made him the author. And it started off with, um, it wasn't fly fishing, it was butterflies or something. A book on, he'd written a book on butterflies. But research showed that that was an effete sport and fishing was much more. So, I mean, planning did make a contribution. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, it was, it was an insight, but it was the client's insight. You know, that was the brief. I want to, the, we need to, we need to broaden its appeal. We need to get more clients taking more display spaces in the, in, in, in the directory. I don't suppose you have a copy of Fly Fishing by J.R. Hartley. It is rather old. I'm sorry. It's by J.R. Hartley. Good old yellow pages. We don't just help with the nasty things in life, like a blocked drain. We're there for the nice things, too. You do? Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, can you keep it for me? My name, oh yes, it's J.R. Hartley. Hello, Richard. Hello. You're not still on about this bike, are you? I remember when bikes were bikes. Proper mudguards and a cover for the chain. Look at that saddle. They're like sitting on a razor blade. Maybe next year, eh? Yeah. How'd you get on, love? I think I found one. Great. Ropers. Says they'll keep it till weekend. You better give us the address then. Good old yellow pages. We're not just there for the nasty things in life, like a leaky roof. We can help with the nice things too. When the film was approved, J.R. Hartley, which happened very quickly, and we wanted to get on air quickly, so I went to see Bob Brooks, the uh, commercials director, um, who we'd worked with quite a lot, and I got on well with him, though he could be quite irascible and testy at times, but I, we got on all right. And I showed him the script. Um, and I was pretty confident that he would like it because it, he was an American and was quite used to the sentiment in ads, you know. And of course, even though I think it's underplayed, I mean, there, there are some things that maybe a British director might have said, I can't do that, you know. Like when he comes home after, his, when J.R. Hartley comes home after the unsuccessful morning in the bookshops and his daughter comes and says, no luck, Dad, never mind, there's still more to try. You know, I can imagine some, some English director saying to me, can't you slip a joke in there or something, you know, just lighten it up a bit. Um, but Bob yeah, liked the script as it was and we went out and shot it around Hampstead and um, I think it was always one of his favourite films because it was a good, you know, it had a beginning, a middle and an end like, you know, a good story should have and um, yeah, so it was, a, it was a very pleasant uh, episode in my advertising life. I was very lucky with 
the art directors. It wasn't luck, actually. I chose them. I chose them for certain attributes. I liked art directors who could draw, uh, which you'd think uh, it was quite rare, actually. Both Neil Godfrey and Brian Byfield, well, and I suppose R and Ron, were the three art directors I probably worked most with over my career. They were all actually very good draftsmen. I don't know why. I mean, I had plenty of art directors who worked for me uh, and, and occasionally worked with me that couldn't draw, and I, I, I didn't um, think it was... Uh, I mean, I hired them, and it didn't seem to be much of a handicap, particularly as computers and things came more to the fore. But I think there's just something about someone who can draw, something about the eye they have, you know. Um, so I always tended to like art directors who could draw, and I was very lucky enough to find three very good ones. Um, I was always very interested in art direction, um, which is handy as I was a creative director as well as a writer. Uh, and as I, I could often see an ad before I had written the line. I knew kind of what I wanted the ad to look like. Though I was often surprised and I was tactful about it. Um, but um, in the same way, I was, I was always very involved in typefaces. And that's one of the advantages in, of owning your own agency. You can spend the money. And one of the great, I remember, you know, at the start of any new campaign, whether it was Well or at uh, a &B with Ron or and The Economist, or, you know, one of the great moments was choosing the typeface. And I don't know quite right. They used to come in rolls. You know, you had a headline and then... But I, we would order 10, 12 variants just to find the right one. And that was working with the typographer at AMV, Joe Hoser. It was, you know, it wasn't just Joe and Ron. I, I mean, I was involved because the way the, uh, the, the typeface was the tone of voice of the ad. You know, and if you could have... You know, if you'd put, um, you know, bold bembo on a shivers headline, it wouldn't be a shivers headline anymore. It would not be the right tone of voice, you know. Quietness and loudness, modernity, uh, you know, um, I don't know. Every issue um, is there in the typeface. So I was always very interested in typography um, and in the minutia of putting press ads together. Uh, happiest moments uh, in advertising have been in the studio late at night as we're cutting type and putting it down and, uh, you know, in the old days, you know, going into the stat machine and just seeing it emerge and seeing the words in the right form sitting there and working with the picture. Just kind of alleluia moments, you know, just just sheer exaltation of seeing this thing come to fruition. And uh, so I was never, I would always, you know, rewrite to get rid of a widow or line spacing, word spacing. And Ron and Neil and Brian were equally kind of fascinated by the minutia. And it is, I mean, I was talking earlier to somebody about a Lufthansa campaign that we did at Door Lane, which was quite a bold, um, a bold campaign because it basically suggested if you want to go long distance comfortably, go by boat. Uh, but Lufthansa recognised the problems with long distance flying and were doing more than most airlines to do something about it and make you comfortable. But I can't look at that campaign now because I think, without naming names, though it's easy to find out, I think the art direction is just a bit clumsy. Um, you know, I don't know if I thought so at the time, but now I do, and looking back at it, it spoils it for me. It, it lacks a certain kind of finesse. And the type, you know, isn't right. For the words. So uh, you make mistakes, but I think any writer who doesn't, you know, this is my um, advice to any copyright, who doesn't involve himself in those things, provided he's got something sensible to say, 
you know, is missing a trick. Uh, maybe not all writers care about it, but I always did because that's the clothes that your words are wearing when they go out, you know. And I wanted them to be well dressed or appropriately dressed. I think awards are a good thing. I've always felt that. Um, they encourage excellence, if, if, you know, if the criteria are right. Um, they give what is a very temporary and ephemeral profession, um, some permanence. I mean, awards and the awards annuals become the reference books and also the teaching books of um, future generations. Um, if you walked into a creative person's office, you would often find a row of annuals on the shelf. And you might think that they're there to croup from, but they're not. They're there to get you in the mood. And I would often, before I embarked on a new campaign or session of trying to think of ideas, I just thumb through an annual. It's a bit like the warm up before a tennis match. You just get in the mood, you know. You see what other people have done or what you've done in your past life. And uh, it just sets you in the mood, reminds you of the standard. So I think that's a very healthy thing. And um, so I, I'm in favour of awards. I think there's a danger of that there are too many of them. Some of them sometimes get silly. You know, I think we went through a period when you know, we had the best use of humour in 50 second film, 15 second film, you know, and it could get nonsense. And it's like everybody has to get a prize. Um, and they have to be very careful the people who run the awards, that they don't debase the coinage, that they keep their standards high, and that they, judges and the juries, are both fair and knowledgeable. So they do know if an ad is a rip-off from something that was done in Brazil or New Zealand. Um, I think you need that knowledge um, so that the right, the right work wins. And generally speaking, um, I think most major awards go to the ads that deserve them. I think there is just some force that you know overcomes all the prejudice, the prejudice, and the, all the kind of vested interests that people and juries can have. Um, but they have to be what you know. It's, it's watchful, and um, I like it when DD, uh, DNAD would say. Nothing's good enough for a gold this year. Now, that was difficult for them to say uh, because it meant the sponsor was going to be disappointed. But really, you know, bug of a sponsor. Uh, it's the work that counts. One thing I'm proud of is that on my first day in advertising at Kodak, I wrote an ad. And on my last day in advertising at AMV, I wrote an ad. It wasn't, I can't say I wrote a complete ad. I was um, adapting or had to make some corrections to a script, the writer of whom was on holiday. But I was writing it on an ad, still copywriting on my last day. Um, apart from that, I don't remember very much. I lingered a bit in the evening for a drink downstairs in the bar and then I drifted home. I'll tell you a story about the best piece of advice I had in advertising. Don't know if it's relevant or not. <coughs> when I went to work at um, Mather and Crowler from Kodak, my salary went up to 900 pounds a year. I was married two children living in a furnished flat. Money was tight. The Saturday, I went in on a Monday, the Saturday before my first child had been born. After about five or six months, at, I was asked to go and meet a man called Mauer, Morris Smelt, go to his office. Morris was one of the creative supervisors. I walked in, sat down, he said, David, uh, we'd like to raise your salary. Well, 
we want to give you £1,400 a year. I said, I don't, I don't, I don't think I can accept that. I'm uneasy about that. And Morris, I think, felt that I didn't think it was enough. So he said, what do you mean? I said, well, and this was about three years after my father had died. And I said, my father worked hard all his life. And when he died, I saw from the books, as I was wrapping up the business, that he was taking £1,400 a year out of the business. And I said, I just feel it's wrong for me to be earning that, you know. Um, I just feel uneasy about it, you know. It's just kind of like he worked so hard to make that, and I've only. So Morris said, "Stop." He said, "My father is the chief customs and excise officer of Great Britain, and I make ten times more than he does." He said, "I'm only offering you this money because we think you're worth it." and that you will find that out sooner or later, and if we're not giving it to you, you'll leave us. He said, you know, just take it. So I did, and I thought afterwards two things. One, I, that it was my first lesson in the, in the um, <coughs> supply and demand uh, <laughs> thing that goes on in business. And the second thing, how good it was that he'd anticipated it, the agency had anticipated it and given it to me before I thought I was worth it. And I went on and did that uh, it, it, when I was giving salaries. I always, we always tried to go there before and, and tell, give people what we thought they were worth even that, you know, before they were asking for it. And that's not really much use to the um, advice to new copywriters. I would say go into it if you think you're going to love it. Because it's a business of great opportunities, but it's a business of disappointments almost on a weekly basis. You're going to lose a lot of babies that you love. A lot of ideas are going to be shot down. You might have a run of bad luck, and you've got to love it to bounce back and to believe that it is only fleeting. So there has to be, I think, a passion there. You have to really want to do it. Um, and then find an agency or a business that suits you, that you can believe in, because you'll find that out there, all agencies are different. They're run by different people who believe in different things. So find the one that matches what you instinctively and intuitively believe would make you happy. Um, but the main thing is it's, it's not a business for half-believers. Um, I couldn't, and when I retired, I mean, there were plenty of opportunities to, you know, be half time or. But if I couldn't be in it a hundred but ten percent, I didn't want to be in it at all. Um, I loved every minute of it, but I've loved every minute of not being in it as well. You know, I found something else in my retirement to, to fill the void. Um, but. While I was in it, I really, really enjoyed it.